OK, so now we go from planets to a much bigger object in some ways. In some ways easier, the equation of state is easier for the solar plasma. It's basically an ideal ionized hydrogen gas. So you don't have to deal with things like the metallic, the phase transition from metallic to liquid uh, hydrogen. But, um, but in many ways, it's more challenging, especially the, the parameter regime is uh, a lot more challenging than, than in planetary models. So I'll, I'll give a brief overview of uh, solar magnetism. I think you had a little taste of this maybe from Dana yesterday. And uh, then talk about uh, convection and mean flows in the sun. So as I mentioned, differential rotation plays a much bigger role in stellar dynamos than it does in planetary dynamos. Uh, and meridional circulation, you, you've already had a taste of this um, from Amitabha this morning, I believe. And, uh, and a hierarchy of convection motions, that near the surface of the sun, the scales are much smaller than the deeper, um, deeper convection. And then talk about small scale dynamos and large scale dynamos. You, again, you've had a little bit of this already. And then talk about what causes the solar cycle. So start with the magnetic activity of the sun. This is uh, why the heliosphere exists. And why we're all here in the heliophysics summer school. But this is the magnetic activity of the th sun shapes the atmosphere of the planets. And it shapes the, the, the heliosphere. And we want to know. Uh, it's, it's been said <laughs> that the function of my institution, of, of, of HIO, is really uh, to understand the induction equation, dB dt, how, to, how the magnetic field changes with time. So of course, all that magnetic activity comes from the interior. So we see magnetic fields passing through the surface of the sun. So they're created in the interior of the sun. And they come out and emerge into the surface. And when you want to understand thing, the t something, the temptation is to take a really close look at it. So this is from the Swedish Solar Telescope. This is a zoom in on these are the highest resolution ground-based observations we have of the surface of the sun. Uh, soon, DKIS that's being built in Hawaii will exceed this. But this is the, uh, on very small scales of the sun, we see this pattern of granulation, bright and dark. And in, in, intermixed in these dark lanes is, are these little bright spots. The basic pattern of light and dark is convection. So you have bright spots are slightly warmer. So this is warm fluid that's rising. And the dark patches here are cool fluid that's descending. And inside these downflow lanes, you see these bright patches here are magnetic fields that are poking out. They tend to, to increase the uh, irradiance locally. Because basically, the reason is because they depress the photosphere. So you're seeing, you're seeing slightly deeper into the sun um, when, when you have magnetic fields present. Uh, so a close look at the surface of the sun reveals chaos, <laughs> reveals uh, a mess. So you can build the bigger telescopes we build, the more detail we see. So this is the, uh, so if you look at the center of the disk, the uh, radial field is the line of sight field. So you can get that from the Zeeman effect. Uh, you can get the tangential field perpendicular to the line of sight through uh, more sophisticated Stokes polarimetry by looking at the, the linear. So this is circular polarization. This is the various types of linear polar, polarization of the light. <coughs> but um, the point is that, so, so with, this is from the Hinode spacecraft, gets down to a resolution of about 200 kilometers on the surface of the sun. Uh, 800,000 kilometers is the radius of the sun. So this is uh, uh, pretty high resolution. But again, you see just mixed polarity fields. So white is field pointing out. Black is field pointing in. And it's, we call it salt and pepper that, that, that uh, uh, blankets the surface of the sun. So, so lots of small scale fields, uh, apparently random. This is just the magnitude of the tangential field. And this is actually bigger than the radial field on small scales. This is about 50 Gauss on average. Uh, well, 
sort of peak values. The saturation of the color table is plus or minus 50 Gauss. Here it's 200 Gauss horizontal fields. So it looks like a mess. But then if you zoom back out, and the amazing thing is if you average this over longitude and then plot it as a function of latitude and time, within this chaotic mess you see order. You see, so this is dating back. This goes from about 1975 to about 2016. And here, outward field is yellow. So that's radially out, outward field. Uh, inward field is blue. So first thing you notice are these butterflies at low latitudes. It looks like a string of butterflies that are flying off, I guess, to the left. Uh, but you see mixed polarity fields that emerge at mid-latitudes. And then individual sunspots don't move in latitude. Individual sunspots come, live for a few weeks, and then go away. But the next month, or the next year, or the next few years, they come progressively closer and closer to the equator. And then when they reach the equator, they go away. And then they start up again. And it looks like. So some of this flux, it looks like it's going, it's migrating toward the poles. And the other thing you see, there's a dipole component. So there's uh, yellow down here, blue up here, and that reverses every 11 years. And opposite signs in each hemisphere, so it's a big dipole moment. And it looks like the field that's reversing these poles is coming from these mid-latitude bands. So it looks like at least superficially from the surface, it looks like the flux that emerges in these regions is propagating up for the poles and, and reversing the poles. So as I already mentioned, these are associated with sunspots. So we, have, we only have really good magnetic measurements for a few solar cycles, but we have sunspot observations that go back for centuries. Uh, this is from the Greenwich Observatory. goes back to about 1875 to 2010. And those, that, butterfly by, that butterfly pattern in the magnetic field, you can see in the sunspots. And uh, incidentally, one of the original, one of the first sun butterfly diagrams is upstairs in HAO, uh, one made by Maunder in around the turn of the century, turn of the uh, 20th century. Um, but you can, you can follow these things back. Uh, and so again, sunspots come out at mid-latitudes. As time goes on, they get closer and closer to the equator. And when, at, when they're at mid-latitudes, that's when the sunspot number is maximum. So this is the number of sunspots uh, really uh, determined by the uh, area percent of the visible hemisphere covered by sunspots. And it goes up and down every 11 years. So the sunspot cycle is 11 years. But since this is associated with a flip in the magnetic polarity, if we go back to this, the actual magnetic cycle is 22 years. So we usually talk, when you, when you hear people talking about the solar cycle, they, they, they usually refer to the 11-year cycle, the 11-year sunspot cycle. But the magnetic cycle is really 22 years, because it takes 22 years between uh, 11 years to flip one side and then 11 years to flip back. All right. So. Where does all, it, all, all this come from? <coughs> the magnetic field of the sun, where does it come from? This is, this is what the solar dynamo is, of course. This is, and, all right. So question, where does the magnetic energy of the, of the sun comes from? The energy that forms all these magnetic features? Uh, what was that, base of the convection zone? But what, what kind of energy? So if energy is conserved. Ther thermal energy, yeah. Ther thermal energy uh, is, uh, is on the right track. But from, from last, th th there's two answers to the question, really. Uh, the ultimate source of the energy and the proximal source of the energy. So as we said last time in the last lecture, where does magnetic energy come from? from the induction equation. 
Yeah, conversion of kinetic energy. So th this, this, uh, it, it, there has to be a kinetic energy somewhere in the link. Now, the magnetic energy comes from kinetic energy. And there is thermal energy also in that link. But the basic idea is, I, I think it's rather poetic that the, the energy that powers the solar magnetism is the sun's own mass, really. So you have fusion that uh, converts mass into radiation and thermal energy. And then convection in the outer envelope of the sun converts that thermal energy into kinetic energy of motions. And then that kinetic energy is converted to magnetic energy. So it's the motions, convection, differential rotation, and meridional circulation that we have to understand to understand the ultimate source of the dynamo. So understanding solar convection and mean flows. So we talked about planets this morning. Uh, some differences is these are not in the rapid rotation limit. If you look at the convective time scale of the deep sun, it's comparable to the rotation period. In the Earth, this was 500 years. This was one day. But here, they're about the same. So it's probably not in that Mach balance. It's, it's not in the same. This nonlinear term, v dot grad v, is very important. You can't just neglect it. And uh, the Rossby number is on the order of 0.1. But we'll, we'll see that uh, near the surface of the sun, granulation has a Rossby number much larger than 1. So there's a transition from rotationally constrained convection to convection that doesn't care about the rotation. So this uh, rotation, the granulation in the surface layers has a turnover time scale of about 15 minutes. And the rotation period is about a month. So granulation doesn't really care about the convection, but there is some convection deep that, that does. Uh, and as I said, the differential rotation plays a big role. So now uh, the magnetic energy over the kinetic energy is not the magnetic energy, unlike planets, is not orders of magnitude bigger than the kinetic energy. They're probably of the same order. We don't really know. But um, the other difference is there's a huge density stratification. So the Boussinesq approximation is out of the question. It's often used for planets, but it doesn't work here. Uh, so it also implies a hierarchy of convective motions, that you have granulation at the surface that we saw in that movie, that zoom in uh, movie. You have small scale granulation, but you also have giant cells that look sort of like banana cells. But here they look more like bananas. Because of the weaker rotational influence, and the density stratification, there's, uh, depending on where you measure it, there's a density stratification of about 10 to the fourth or 10 to the fifth across the convection zone. So because of the large density stratification and the weaker rotational influence, the bananas kind of curve, curve more. They're, they're more on radial surfaces than on Z surfaces. So here they were aligned with the rotation axis. Here they're more sort of rolls that wrap around in radius. Um, and they drive a differential rotation, which we'll talk about. Uh, yeah, so, but we can still use the analastic approximation. The Mach number is still a lot less than one. So that divergence of density, or divergence of rho, u, rho v is still close to zero. All right. Uh, good question. Is there observational evidence for banana cells? There's, the, the short answer is not really. Nothing, nothing that's really well accepted. There are hints. Like there's been some report of alignment of supergranules, kind of a north-south alignment of supergranules at the surface. But um, others have claimed to see uh, giant cells. But um, some of the claims look very different than this. Uh, some of the claims look like they're oriented kind of in the east-west direction instead of north-south which doesn't make sense from a fluid dynamics <laughs> perspective. But, but, but that's, that's what they say. But other, others, other, others have, um, so, so sort of these are bananas in two senses. They're curved this way. But when the differential rotation tries to shear them out, so they're also curved in this direction. So they're, uh, they, they kind of, at the equator, they tail off in a westward direction at higher latitudes. 
And there's some evidence, this is work by uh, David Hathaway. Lisa, were you on that paper too? Yeah, that, that, um, and, and, and Lisa about detecting sort of that, that north, west, southeast um, orientation at mid-latitudes. You, you don't really see the north-south stuff at, at the equator, but it, yeah, at mid-latitudes it looks roughly like what you'd expect from the banana cells. And there are also other um, possibilities too. So you off, so sometimes you see coronal holes that, uh, that extend down to low latitudes. So coronal holes are usually at the north and south poles. Sometimes you see them um, extending down toward the equator. And they're usually in a north-south orientation when you see that. So one possibility is that they're nestled in a downflow lane, that they feed, that they, those things, those coronal holes thread through and are sampling the deep convection. So there, there are other possibilities too. But. So there are some hints, but no, no compelling, well-accepted evidence. Um, so the dominant size of solar convection in the photosphere is this granulation. So here's a movie of it. Uh, the size scale is about one to two megameters. Velocity scale is about one or two kilometers per second. And as I said, the time scale is about 10 or 15 minutes. So you usually think about the sun as being on time scales much longer than human time scales, but there are some processes on the sun that occur over the course of minutes. So that's the biggest scale, uh, the most prominent scale of convection. But you can see other scales too, in particular supergranulation. You can see that in what's called the magnetic network. So if you look in calcium-2 emission, which tends to trace these vertical magnetic fields, you see kind of this doppling, doppled pattern, or dappled pattern. Uh, on the, so the, the, the most prominent things are sunspots and active regions. But beyond the active regions, you see sort of this pattern, this cellular pattern. And that, that, that's when um, vertical magnetic fields get nestled in the downflow lanes. They, the downflow lanes are regions of convergence, where the fluid converges and then goes down. And then the magnetic fields gather in the downflow lanes. And so these size scales are on the order of 30 or 35 megameters and have velocities about 500 meters per second <clears throat> and lifetimes a little longer, about 20 hours. But that's still a lot less than the rotation period. The rotation period is about 28 days. So even this is not very influenced by rotation. This, uh, th these these uh, uh, turnover time scale here, so the supergranulation cells proceed almost as if, if the sun wasn't rotating, they would probably look very similar. But you're starting to get to the scales where rotation makes a difference. Um, you can also see these in Doppler measurements. So if you look, if you take, uh, if you look at a line on the surface of the sun and infer the line of sight velocity from the Doppler shift, you see this. One side is blue, one side is red. And this is, of course, the rotation of the sun. But if you subtract that out, subtract out the rotation, you subtract off a convective blue shift. This comes about because of the density stratification. So you have, because in that granulation pattern, the, the upflows were, were wide, the downflows were narrow. And that gives a, a general convective blue shift to stuff you're not resolving. If you smooth out over that, the downflows are faster than the upflows. And uh, it, it looks like there's a mass flux down because you're just not resolving it. Um, so if you subtract that out and you subtract out the meridional flows, then you get this. And so you see these patterns on the edge. Why do we see the patterns on the edge and not in the middle? Yep, that's right. So in the middle, so the Doppler shift is the line of sight velocity, right? But there's no really radial flow through the surface of the sun. The flow is mostly horizontal. So the line of sight is on the limb of the sun. So that's why you don't see anything here, but on the limb. And this is about the same size scale, about 35 megameters, as the magnetic network that you see. Yep. Uh, what I'm saying is that um, if we go back to the granulation picture, that's oh well, 
let's go to this one. What I'm saying here is the upflows occupy are broad and the downflows are narrow. So the upflows occupy more space. So if there's an equal amount of mass coming up as there is going down, then the downflows have to be faster. Because if you have, if you have a big area where there's mass coming up and then a tiny area where it's going back down, in order for that same mass going up, coming back down, this has to be a lot faster. So there's a, and that's, that's because of the density stratification. As a little parcel of fluid rises, the density, the surrounding density is becoming less, so it expands. And then as it goes down, it contracts. So, so as the fluid comes up, the downflows are shipped, are squeezed into these little lanes. Yeah. Yeah, but right at the surface, it's, it's zero, right at the photosphere. So, so the, there, there's radial motion that comes up, but, but at the photosphere, that turns around into, so, so it's mainly horizontal. Yeah, yeah, so you're seeing it where it's turning over. Really, it's, um, it's driven mainly by the radiative cooling in the photosphere. So the, the time scale for radiative cooling is about 20 seconds. So uh, the, the plasma on the surface of the sun cools very rapidly, and it becomes dense, and then it plummets. And the upflows are kind of a response to that. So that they, feel, they feel this fluid going down, and then there's a pressure gradient that's set up, and, and it sort of sucks in fluid. To, so the upflows are kind of a response to the downflows. All right. So you have this hierarchy of convective scales. Uh, so this is a velocity spectrum versus spherical harmonic wave number. Uh, so this is sort of in meters per second. And it peaks at a spherical harmonic wave number of about a few thousand. So this is, this is the granulation. And then there's a little bump here. So uh, the solid line here is Let's see, that's a correlation tracking. So that's an observational result, that solid line. Um, this is a numerical simulation of convection, of granulation. Uh, this is based on um, Doppler measurements on the surface of the sun. So this is, uh, this is an observational result as well. This is also an observational result here. Cor correlation tracking is when you look at little bright points, the, like those little bright points we saw in the downflow lanes. If you follow those, you can infer a velocity of them. So you can get a power spectrum of velocities. Uh, and it peaks at this granulation scale. You see a little bump at super, super granulation. But there's a big hierarchy of convective motions. And the main idea, there's a cartoon here. The main idea is because of the density stratification, Anything that's flowing up, so, so pick a radial level below the surface of the sun. Anything that's flowing up through this level, it's unlikely to get to the surface. Because the density is so low here, it's more likely to come up and get pulled into a downflow lane. So a lot of the mass going down will go through this entire layer. So anything going, through, going downward at the surface will go through the entire layer, but this mass flowing up will not. So this, this uh, lasts about a density scale height. So the correlation length for upflows is about a density scale height. They come up, get, get filtered into downflow lanes, and trained into downflow lanes. But downflows can, can penetrate through. And that leads to a merging of, of plumes. So you have this network, this downflow network at the surface, and they they merge into larger and larger super plumes as, the, as they go down. So the length scales of the convection increase as you go down. So if you look at the distance between two plumes, it's one to two megameters up here, but down here it might be 30 megameters. So this is this increase of um, time and distance scales as you go down is likely responsible for that supergranulation. But supergranulation probably isn't uh, 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 specific scale. There's a, there's a whole spectrum of, uh, of motions that give you a, gives you a whole spectrum. There's some debate as to whether this bump is significant or not. The simulations 
suggests that it is not, but the observers will insist that it is. So, but it, the simulators, is so often the supergranulation pattern is associated with um, the magnetic network. So there could, be, there could be a selection effect that's associated with the lifetime of these elements. If they only last a certain amount of time, then that, then that could pick out a certain scale. But like I said, you see the same thing in uh, Doppler measurements too. But this is, a, uh, this is a simulation of surface convection of very, in a very deep box by uh, Stein and Nordland. But here you can see the increase of length scales and time scales as you go down. So this is the granulation in the top. The, uh, let's see, blue, I believe, is upflowing fluid, red is downflows. So the time scales up here, but these, these plumes merge into bigger and bigger plumes that have longer and longer time scales as you go down. But this still only is the outer 3% of the sun, goes down to about 0.97, but the convection zone goes all the way down to 0.7 our sun. So the question, so those of us who do the deep interior call this still solar dermatology. This is just the outer skin. <laughs> So what lies deeper still? At some point, as the scales get larger and larger, the time scales and the length scales get larger and larger, at some point, they have to feel the Coriolis force. So this is, we call these giant cells. Again, there's um, not a lot of observational evidence. These are masked by what happens at the surface. These, these have a much weaker velocity, at least by an order of magnitude, than, um, than granulation. So they, it's, they're hard to pick out out of granulation. But, um, but we think that eventually the, the time scales get to be days or months. And at that point, the Rossby number becomes small enough that they feel the rotation. So superficially, this, is, this looks a lot like granulation. This is the time in days. <coughs> this is from a simulation. So it's a Moeti projection. So you see the full 360 degrees in longitude, pole to pole in latitude. Uh, the bright spots here are, so the, the radial velocity is what's shown. The uh, orange yellowish parts are upflows. The um, blue spots are downflows. And it looks superficially like the granulation, but on a much larger scale, on the order of 100 megameters. And if you look closely, you see sort of a counterclockwise swirl in the north and a clockwise swirl in the south. And that comes from the conservation of angular momentum. As fluid converges into these downflows, it tends to conserve its angular momentum locally, and it spins up. So this is the figure skater pulling, pulling her, her arms in to make her spin faster. And that's what you see in these downflow lanes. So near the, in, within the downflow lanes, you see a different sign of vorticity in the north and south. And if you really look close, you can kind of see a north-south alignment in this pattern. And if you don't believe me, that becomes more obvious if you look deeper in the shell. So this is near the surface. This is about, uh, this is uh, 0.98 our sun. Another thing, these simulations usually do not go all the way to the surface because no global simulation has the resolution to capture granulation. You would need spherical harmonics of about 4,000, which is an order of magnitude bigger than we can do. So we stop at a, just below the surface, usually 0.96 or 0.98 our sun. So this is what it looks like at the surface. And cutting off the poles just to show the low latitudes. And this is what it looks like in the mid-convection zone. So here you see this alignment. These are banana cells. But because of the asymmetry between upflows and downflows, you see them mainly in the downflow lanes. So uh, in, in the sun, these Boosie columns are, are much more complicated, and they're asymmetric. So you see broad upflows, narrower downflows, and it's the downflows where you really see this north-south alignment. And if you could see deep inside the sun, it would be more prominent than it is at the surface. Yeah, the lower boundary condition is, if we back up to here, I didn't really talk about that. 
But so energy is generated in the core. And throughout most of the solar interior, it filters out by the diffusion of radiation. So this looks like a, a energy flux that's proportional to the temperature gradient. So, um, but as you get um, further and further up in the atmosphere, the opacity, as the, uh, as the temperature goes down, the opacity of the solar plasma is, increases. So it becomes um, harder to get the heat flux out in the, uh, here. And the temperature, grid, sort of the heat flux bottles up and increases the temperature gradient until you have convection. So it's the convergence of this radiative flux. So you have this radiative flux that heats the bottom of the convection zone, and then that, that triggers the convection. Yeah, you, you, it, it's, um, it's represented. It, the conditions in the solar interior are, are dense enough that it, you can represent it as just a diffusion. So there's a radiative conductivity, thermal conductivity, kappa rad, and uh, proportional to the temperature gradient, dTDR. So there's a heat flux that's proportional to, to dTDR. And that um, carries out the full solar luminosity at the bottom of the simulation domain. And then it drops off as you go up. So that convergence of the heat flux is a heating that heats the bottom and then triggers convection. All right. So we don't really know what the Rossby number is in the sun. This is, again, uh, uh, work by uh, Nick Featherstone showing a range of different Rossby numbers. So here, the Rossby number, a lot less than one. You see banana cells that look a lot like the planetary convection regimes. Um, often, the poles can be suppressed. It's easier to get the heat out by these boosted columns outside the tangent cylinder. And the sun has a, a smaller aspect ratio than most planets. So the, the, the Earth is a deeper convection zone. The sun is only convective in the outer 30%. So if if the banana cells only live outside the tangent cylinder, then uh, in certain parameter regimes, the, the poles can be pretty quiet, and the, and the, uh, and the uh, lower latitudes can be convecting away. So um, one of the constraints we have on solar convection is that the flux we see coming out of the surface of the sun doesn't depend much on latitude. So in models like this, there's a lot more heat flux coming out at the equator than there are at the poles. So the deep interior of the sun probably is not a very low Rossby number. Um, but this is a non-rotating case. So this, this you don't see, uh, this, this you don't see the uh, banana cells at all. So the sun is somewhere in between here. So, so this is going through stages of, of Rossby number. The sun is probably something like this that you have these, these banana cells at low latitudes, but at high latitudes, you have more of these elongated uh, convection, convection cells that look looks kind of more like granulation up here, but with a vorticity in it, with a spin. But how do we know that we're there? I, there the giant cells are there. They're very difficult to detect at the surface. People have been looking for a long time. But um, our main... Uh, diagnostics for probing the internal solar convection is that that's how the sun shines. So uh, th that carries a heat flux from 0.7 our sun to the surface. And the other diagnostic we have is through helioseismology. So, so helio meaning the sun, seismology meaning um, sound waves. So like, uh, uh, like waves in the earth, seismology of the earth measures earthquakes. So, so the earth has both pressure modes, which are sound modes, and elastic modes. Um, the sun only has P modes, although it has, has internal gravity waves um, down here, but those really haven't been detected. But it's mostly sound waves. So we can infer from the frequencies of sound waves on the surface um, those are shifted if the sun is rotating. So if you have, if you look at this, the surface of the sun is vibrating, and, and you can look at the vibrations on the surface of the sun, and from the frequencies of vibrations, you can figure out what the structure of the sun is below the surface and what the, uh, what the rotation is below the surface. Because 
uh, modes, the, these global modes, ones that are propagating in the prograde direction and the retrograde directions will be shifted. They'll have different frequencies. And from that shift, you can infer what the rotation is doing below the surface. And so some interesting things about the differential rotation of the sun is there's a monotonic decrease of about 30% from equator to pole. First of all, 30% is huge. So there, you can't, so there must be something, uh, in the giant cells down here, must, there must be something um, that is transporting angular momentum from the poles to the equator that's spinning up the equator. And uh, second of all, it's not banded zonal flows like Jupiter. It's not a, lot, a series of east-west bands. It's just monotonic. It's fast equator, slow pole. So that's interesting. The second thing to notice is there's a nearly uniform rotation in the radiative zone. So that means, or that implies, that conven convection is implicated as the source of the differential rotation, that this is rotating differentially, equator faster than the pole, but the stable interior is not, really. So that is pretty good evidence that convection is responsible for, for the existence of this differential rotation. And we infer the base of the convection zone both from um, structure models and from helioseismic inversions. So that's, that's one thing you can tell from the inversions is what the stratification is. Uh, so another thing, merely radial contours at mid-latitudes. We talked about the Taylor-Proudman theorem before helioseismology. So helioseismology really got going in the late 80s and 1990s. Before helioseismology, people knew that the surface of the sun was rotating. By looking at sunspots, you can tell that the equator is rotating faster than the poles, or at least mid-latitudes, because there aren't any sunspots at the poles. Um, but people thought that that would be aligned with the rotation axis, like the Taylor-Proudman theorem. So they, they thought that this would just penetrate down into the convection zone on surfaces aligned with the rotation axis. But that's not the case. So there are a lot of puzzles in here. Um, radial gradients at the top and bottom, this is called the near surface shear layer. So as you go in, there's an increase of the angular velocity uh, from the surface to a latitude of about 0.90, or sorry, a radius of about 0.95 our sun. And then at the bottom, there's a sharp transition from the differential rotation of the convection zone into the uniform rotation of the interior. And this is called the tachocline, tacho meaning speed, and cline meaning change. So this is a change in the rotational speed of the sun at the base of the convection zone. And another uh, interesting thing is that the interior rate is intermediate between the equator and poles. Now we think, we look at rapidly, we, we look at young stars we can look at other stars that are a lot younger than the sun, and they're usually rotating a lot faster. So stars, because of the winds, they spin down over time. So stellar winds take away angular momentum. So as a star ages over the course of, for the case of the sun, it's been about five, six billion years, it was probably rotating 100 times faster when it was born. So, but somehow, this being intermediate between the equator and the pole means that there's a coupling between the stable zone and the convection zone. And the other interesting thing is it's persistent in time. Like I said, we have helioseismic inversions going back to about the 1990s. Uh, but this is a, a great plot that goes back to the original um, measurements of differential rotation by uh, Richard Carrington in 1863. So that's the squares here. And this is done by um, looking at sunspots. So as sunspots were closer to the solar equator, they rotate faster than sunspots at higher latitudes. And this is a 1% difference. So the uh, rotation rate of the sun hasn't really changed by more than a few percent in at least 150 years. There are subtle variations, and we can measure um, variations now, significant variation called, variations called torsional os oscillations. But for, for the most part, that's only at a, 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 like a 1% level. So just in this 
rotation profile inferred from Helios' seismology. There's a lot of interesting physics in here. Any one of these questions, you could pretty much do a PhD thesis on, I think. Uh, the other type of flow, so differential rotation is the mean east-west flow if you average over longitude. The mean north-south, uh, the flow in the meridional plane, so that includes the latitudinal flow and the radial flow, is uh, referred to as the meridional circulation, because it's on a meridional plane. Uh, it, it's really hard. Vertical flows are, are hard to detect, but we can detect horizontal flows. Uh, so this is, this is the flow in the latitudinal direction. So red is toward the north, and this is from helix seismology. So these are, um, this is, these are more difficult measurements for a couple of reasons. First of all, um, the meridional flows are much weaker than the differential rotation. So the differential rotation is about 200 meters per second on the surface. The meridional flows are about 20 meters per second about an order of magnitude less, but that's two orders of magnitude less than the granulation. So the granulation was about two kilometers per second. So picking out this amid the chaos of the, of the granulation is difficult. The other reason that makes it difficult is it's anti-symmetric about the equator. It's, uh, it's toward, the, toward the poles, so it's, so it's that way up here and that way down here. So it tends to average out in the global inversions, the, the, those global oscillation modes of the sun, uh, global acoustic oscillations can give you the differential rotation, but they can't, they aren't very sensitive to the meridional circulation. So you, use, you need to use a technique called local helioseismology where you look at local patches of acoustic waves, not as opposed to global resonant modes. Um, but so this, uh, basically it comes, this, this inversion here goes toward the poles uh, near the surface. And you can measure that also near the surface. These are, uh, this, this right mire here is Lisa, <laughs> who's back there. But you can, uh, you can measure it at the surface based on uh, correlation tracking of magnetic elements uh, uh, that tend to drift toward the poles. Um, and then you can use seismology to try to measure it deeper down. So one thing we know is it's toward the poles near the surface with a rate of about 20 meters per second. And it's variable in time. These are um, Doppler measurements of the surface rotation rate or surface meridional flow rate versus year it's from 1996 to 2009, and it fluctuates a lot. Um, so it's, it, but it's generally toward the poles of about 20 meters per second, variable in time, and that's about all we really know. There, there have been inversions, recent inversions suggest that there's a reversal in the mid-convection zone, so it goes toward the poles near the surface then toward the equator down here, and then toward the poles again. But, um, but these are th different groups working on the same data even get different results here. So uh, it, it's probably clear that there's, there's probably multiple cells in radius, but the details of that are still, um, are still debated. But we do know that there's a, there's a meridional flow. And so where do these flows come from? You have to look again at the uh, momentum equation. Uh, if you ignore magnetic fields for the time being, and you just look at the phi momentum equation, you can define the local uh, angular momentum per specific angular momentum per unit mass as V phi times the moment arm. So lambda, this is cylindrical coordinates, Z and the uh, direction of the rotation axis, and lambda is the cylindrical radius this way. So in, uh, it's R sine theta in spherical uh, coordinates. Um, but so that's the V phi times the moment arm. That's the specific angular momentum. And then L without the asterisk is the longitudinal average. So these brackets indicate an average over longitude. Okay, so you go with that. So the phi momentum equation you can write like this. Um, d by dt of rho times L star equals the divergence of the angular momentum flux. And there's a pressure gradient here. The density doesn't come into it because it doesn't have, or sorry, the gravity doesn't come into it because it doesn't have a phi direction. Uh, we've neglected the viscous diffusion here. But the Coriolis force is kind of captured. This kind of captures the V dot grad V term and the Coriolis force both. Um, so now we average this over longitude. 
and we can write it like this, d by dt of rho times L is equal to divergence. This is a flux carried by the meridional circulation. So this is angular momentum flux uh, moved around by the meridional flow. And then there's this extra term called the Reynolds stress. The, so the flux FMC is equal to the mean mass flux, rho Vm averaged over, over um, uh, longitude. So this is that meridional flow that I was talking about, or meridional circulation. This L is the mean um, uh, angular momentum, specific angular momentum. And uh, so that's that term there. This is the Reynolds stress. So this looks like rho times the moment arm times Vm prime V phi prime. Vm means flows in the meridional plane. So this is uh, Vr. It has a radial component and a, and a latitudinal component. So there's a VR prime and a V theta component here. But this is uh, angular momentum transport by the convection. And this is angular momentum transport by the circulation. All right. So now we talked about these north-south downflow lanes. So we have these banana cells. As I said, the, the sun is probably in a regime like this. It has this north-south alignment of downflows at low latitudes. So this is a north-south downflow lane. So this black line indicates a downflow near the surface. So the red lines indicate the flow that converges into that. So you have flow that converges into the downflow lane and then goes down. But then you look at the Coriolis force on that converging flow. And in the northern hemisphere, things that are moving, the flows are diverted to the right by the Coriolis force. So flows that are moving in a westward direction are diverted toward the poles. Flows that are moving in a prograde or eastward direction are diverted toward the equator. This gives you a V theta prime V phi prime that's greater than zero, which means angular momentum is transported toward the equator. So this is speeding up the equator and slowing down the poles. And that, again, that co comes from the Coriolis force. And just to kind of wake you up after lunch, now consider a downflow lane that's oriented in the east-west direction. And the red indicates a flow converging into that downflow lane. So the flow comes in and goes down. Now, which direction would you expect the angular momentum transport to be? The Reynolds stress is here. So again, Vm prime, there's a, we can talk about here, we're not thinking about the radial component here. So you can think of Vm prime as basically being V theta prime, V theta prime, V phi prime. So what kind of correlations would be induced here? Might help to pull out a piece of paper and draw it. So positive V phi is toward the east toward the right, and positive V theta is downward. So this, this is, the positive v, v theta is toward the south. So any ideas? So remember the Coriolis force diverts things toward the right. Diverts flows, no matter which way you're going, it, it makes you go toward the right. Yeah. The one down goes toward the east. If you're going, if you're going from the north to the south and you're, you're veered off to the right, You'd go this way, right? 
But if you're going up and you're diverted to the right, go to the east. So any guesses for the angular momentum transport? Oh, yes. All right, so let's go this way. Let's go back to this. So this has a negative v phi, goes toward the west, and a negative v theta, because it's going north. So when you multiply them together, this is positive. And then you look over here, this has a positive v phi, and a positive v theta. So both of them are greater than zero. Does that make sense? All right, so come back to this one. Yeah, that's right. So if, you're, if this one is diverted toward that way, it's a positive v phi and a negative v theta, right? And then this one is diverted toward its right. So that's a negative, it's a positive v theta and a negative v phi, right? So yeah, it, it, it's angular momentum transport toward the poles. So that's why we think any, any numerical simula simulation of convection that, that establishes a fast equator in slow poles has this north-south alignment. He has these banana cells. That's a key component. You need, you need a north-south alignment if you're going to speed up the equator relative to the poles. If you have things that are aligned east-west, you would expect the convection to speed up the poles relative to the equator. The uh, extreme example of that is a meridional flow. So think about an axisymmetric circulation toward the pole. So if you have an axisymmetric ring of fluid that's going toward the pole, that's when, th that's when this, this um, downflow lane would be symmetric. It would go all the way around in longitude, right? An axisymmetric ring of fluid toward the pole, as it comes close to the rotation axis, it would spin up if it conserves its angular momentum. So, so yeah, so some of the, I, I mentioned some evidence for giant cells, putative evidence for giant cells. There, was, there were papers about 10 years ago that said they found giant cells and they looked like this. And I, I, I find that dubious because <laughs> that would be hard to understand. But, um, but if it's confirmed, then, then who am I to say that it's wrong? All right, so that differential rotation Fast equator, slow pull is set up by that Reynolds stress, by those banana cells. Um, but why the conical orientation? That's hard to understand, um, but it's attributed to thermal gradient. So this here is called thermal wind balance. It's basically the same thing as that Mach balance, but without the magnetic fields. So if you have Mach balance and you toss out the magnetic fields, then it's called geostrophic balance. It's a balance between the Coriolis force, the pressure gradient, and the, uh, and the buoyancy. And if you work it out and say that the convection zone is nearly adiabatically stratified, you get that d by dz of omega is proportional to the latitude entropy gradient. Uh, entropy, you can think of as similar to temperature in a stratified atmosphere. So this says that if you have warm poles, so if a d omega dz, omega, Let's, so this is a line of constant z. So d omega dz, as you go up in z, omega is decreasing. It's fast down here and it's slow up there. So as you cross this yellow line, d omega dz is negative. So that means ds d theta will have to be negative in the northern hemisphere, which means toward the poles. So the idea is you can think of this as um, you can think of this as a balance. What this term here is, it's an inertial term. You can think of it in terms of a centrifugal force. So think of fluid going around here. It's rotating very fast, um, and it's being the centrifugal force is going to want to push it away. Up here, 
This also feels the centrifugal force that wants to push it away from the rotation axis. But the centrifugal force is stronger here than here because this is rotating faster. So if you require that mass is conserved and mass has to follow a closed loop, what goes, what goes to the right must also go to the left, then that, that rotation profile, d omega dz less than zero, will drive a counterclockwise circulation. So that will snap this back to that Taylor problem pro profile. This will snap this back to cylindrical rotation contours in a rotation period in a month if you don't do something to, to avoid that. And what do you do to avoid that? You make the poles slightly warmer than the equator, so you have a buoyancy force. The poles want to rise up. So the, you have buoyancy that, makes, that wants to make the poles rise up. So the differential rotation, the inertia of the differential rotation induces a counterclockwise uh, meridional circulation. And the buoyancy indu induces a clockwise circulation, and they balance. So that, that's how we think we explain these non-cylindrical contours, these radial contours. And the required amplitude is about one part in 10 to the 5. It's tiny. It's about 10 Kelvin pole to equator temperature difference compared to the 2.2 million Kelvin background. All right, but this can also account for the meridional circulation. So here I've uh, d drawn a simple circulation cell that goes toward the poles near the surface and towards the equator at the bottom of the convection zone. So a single circulation cell per hemisphere. And the idea is you have convective angular momentum transport. If uh, convection is moving angular momentum toward the lower boundary here, so you're speeding up. It converges at the lower boundary because it smacks into the bottom of the convection zone. So the idea is you're speeding up the um, bottom of the convection zone and slowing down the top. But if you're speeding this up, think about a ring of fluid that's going faster, that it's going to feel a centrifugal force that's going to make it drift away from the rotation axis. And the same thing here. If you have an angular momentum transport toward the equator, so that you're speeding up the equator, this convergence of angular momentum, you're speeding up the equator, that's going to induce the fluid to drift out. So if you have angular momentum transport downward and toward the equator, as seems to be the case in the sun, then you'd expect a counterclockwise circulation up here and a clockwise circulation here. So um, as I said, there's some evidence now that there might be multiple cells in radius, but the same you, you can the similar ideas apply. If you if you have this angular momentum transport, if it's downward, if you say that granulation tends to conserve its angular momentum and transport um, angular momentum in, and it converges here, then you would expect a smaller circulation cell. You'd expect a return flow that's higher up. So that's the idea of, of the meridional circulation. Um, so now we get into dynamo models, now that we understand the flows. Uh, this was, if you look up, this is Dynamo Man, a uh, cartoon from the 60s. But I, I like this. It's, uh, it says, it says, enemies of my country, beware. I, want, I have taken a blood oath to destroy you. So, <laughs> so yes. So, we need a hero to come in to generate the magnetic fields of the sun. And that, of course, is the induction equation. So, um, so this is the induction equation that we know and well. Lesson number one in solar dynamo theory, which you already learned this morning, is that if you specify what the velocity is, if you just put in some profile, then this equation is linear. And that's tremendously useful for theory. So much of the theory in the past 50 years has been concerned with kinematic dynamos. Because th this is the definition of kinematic. If V does not depend on B, then this equation is linear. And then asking whether something or not will be a dynamo is just like solving an eigenvalue problem. So you can put in, for B, you can put in like e to the i omega t, and, or e, e to the omega t. And 
the real part of, of the eigenvalue indicates whether the solution exponentially grows or decays. And then the imaginary depart, part determines whether it's oscillatory or not. So that's, um, so a lot of, most of dynamo theory is based on kinematic modeling because it's so straightforward. But lesson number two is no real dynamo is kinematic. So uh, at some point, we, we see in nature that magnetic fields don't grow exponentially. They, eventually, they have, to, they have to reach a saturation value. So it suggests two kinds of dynamos. One is essentially kinematic, that you start out with the small seed field, and then it grows exponentially until it becomes so strong that you can't neglect the Lorentz force anymore. That the, because of the Lorentz force, it feeds back on the velocity field, and it changes the velocity. And then the um, basic question is the issue of dynamo saturation. What stops the exponential growth? Uh, there's another class, which is essentially nonlinear, is the velocity field that gives rise to the dynamo action comes from the magnetic field itself. It intrinsically depends on the magnetic field. And then this is essentially nonlinear. And then the focus shifts toward how do you, how do you excite it? How, if, if the velocity field depends on the magnetic field and the magnetic field depends on the velocity field, how do you, how do you excite it? Um, almost all work in dynamo theory is based on this kind of idea, because this is hard. Yeah, often this is associated with uh, instabilities of the magnetic field. So if you, have, um, if you have some magnetic field and it goes through an instability, that triggers a velocity field. But, um, but yeah, you have to have, uh, yeah, yeah, there, I, I, there's some, a few examples of this. Most are from nonlinear simulations, MHD simulations. But there's, there's little analytical work. Um, so where do the magnetic fields come from? If you look at the, uh, our friend, the induction equation, and this next line looks complicated, but if you just, this is exactly the same as that top equation. I've just used some vector identities to recast um, it so into a Lagrangian derivative. So capital db dt is dbt but plus v dot grad b. And that equals to all this stuff on the right-hand side. But if you make the simplifying assumption that the flow is Boussin-esque, or del dot v equals 0, and for now, let's say the diffusion is 0, then this term is 0, that term is 0, then this induction equation can just be written like this, dB dt equals b dot grad v. And that's exactly the same equation as if you looked at, if you put two little particles in a flow, and you looked at the equation that describes the distance between them. How does the distance between them change with time? So if your um, d by dt of the distance between them is equal to velocity gradients in the direction of this displacement. So d by, d by dt of this distance is delta dot grad v, which is exactly the same as the induction equation. So this is what the idea of stretching, you hear people talking about stretching of field lines, uh, amplifying the field. That's, that's field stretching. And you can express this as the Jacobian of the velocity field, basically velocity gradients. And the eigenvalues of the Jacobian are what are called Lyapunov exponents, local Lyapunov exponents. And they say that in a chaotic flow, the distance between two particles inside the flow will diverge exponentially. So if you have a magnetic field, that implies an exponential growth of the magnetic field. So that, that by, by, by a, field, a flow with chaotic streamlines can stretch the magnetic field, can amplify the magnetic field by stretching it. Um, but there's a caveat here. If del dot v equals 0, then the three Lyapunov exponents in the three directions have to sum to zero. So if you're stretching in one direction, you have to be squeezing in the other direction. So if there's diffusion, if, if there's a finite amount of diffusion, then the squeezing can kill you while the stretching, so it's a fight between the amplification by stretching and the, and the ohmic diffusion by squeezing. And 
again, it's not trivial to figure out whether a given flow is going to be a dynamo or not, which is going to win. But the upshot is, from numerical experiments, we think that if the magnetic Reynolds number is big enough, that usually the stretching wins. Uh, so this gives rise to the idea of local dynamo action in the sun and stars. So here, granulation has a time scale of 10 to 15 minutes. Giant cells have time scales of days to months. So if you're in a granulation cell and overturning on a time scale of 10 or 15 minutes, you don't care what the giant cells are doing. You're going to amplify field on a scale of time scale of 10 to 15 minutes. And so it's going to look random. So this, this chaotic stretching is going to generate small scale flows. Turbulent flows beget turbulent fields. And if you think of an eddy, so think of a kind of a velocity field, a turbulent eddy like this, it's going to wrap up the magnetic field. So the length scale in the direction of the flow is comparable to the velocity field, but perpendicular to V, it, the magnetic field gets folded. So the length scales in this direction are a lot smaller than the size of the original eddy. The magnetic field gets folded upon itself. So this tends to create magnetic fields on scales smaller than the velocity field on tiny, tiny scales until, uh, uh, until this wrapping up balances ohmic diffusion. And so this is what you see in simulations of granulation. You see it creating, this is the salt and pepper. This is the magnetic carpet. So you see granulation creating all kind of turbulent velocity fields. Flux expulsion, uh, magnetic flux gets pushed out of the turbulent regime. This is the top of the photosphere here. This is magnetic energy. So where it's bright is the magnetic energy. There's a lot of magnetic energy in downflows, both horizontal and vertical. It gets all chewed up like spaghetti. But then the horizontal fields get pushed out. And right at the top of the convection zone, there's a lot of horizontal fields that get pushed out of the convection zone. That's called flux expulsion. And I, I told you at the beginning, I showed that those, those images of the vertical field and the horizontal field and the photosphere and the horizontal field was even stronger than the vertical field. And simulations can capture that. So that's local dynamo action. So you can define a local dynamo or a small scale dynamo as something that creates magnetic fields on scales smaller than the velocity field. So this is, if this is a correlation length of the magnetic field, this is a correlation length of the velocity field. The magnetic field is much smaller. And you can show from the induction equation that it scales roughly as a magnetic Reynolds number to the minus 1 half. So if the magnetic Reynolds number is large, then the, velocity, then the magnetic scales can be much less than the velocity scales until ohmic diffusion comes in. Um, so that gives rise to that salt and pepper, that magnetic carpet. But what about the solar cycle? Why, where does, how do you get a dipole field out of that? Um, so we define a large scale dynamo that generates magnetic fields on scales much larger than the scale of the velocity field. And so we're not, the, the solar dynamo might not be a large scale dynamo because, um, because you might have, in the deep convection zone, you might have scales where these two are comparable. You might have scales uh, of convection that are on the scale of the, um, the size of the sun as a whole. But, um, but large-scale dynamos can make large-scale fields from small-scale velocity fields. And the recipe for doing that, first of all, Lagrangian chaos, that, that stretching, chaotic stretching of field lines helps uh, to build magnetic energy. But rotational shear, the omega effect. Oops, that's supposed to be an omega. Uh, so you can build toroidal fields with shear. And helicity. Uh, you heard about the alpha effect this morning. Uh, that is a way of, so there's this uh, magnetic helicity. So this describes a twist in the velocity field. There, there's different kinds of helicity, but they're all kind of spiraling. So in the, in the terms of, of kinetic helicity, this is um, vorticity dotted into velocity. So this is about motions, if you have spiraling motions. So this is motion from left to right. But it also has a vorticity. So if you take the curl of the velocity, it's also from left to right. So it's kind of a spiraling motion. That's kinetic helicity. Magnetic helicity, if this is a field line, 
you, you have the same thing. So magnetic helicity is A dot B, where A is the vector potential here. Or there's something called a current helicity, which is J dot B. J is related to curl B. But basically, taking something and dotting it into its curl gives you a sense of spiraling motions or spiraling fields. And the, um, the alpha effect is an example of helicity. So as, as Amitava showed, it's related to the kinetic helicity of the flow. But there's all, it's, it's, it's part of a more, general, um, a more general concept that you can build large-scale fields by helicity. So in, 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 in ideal MHD, if, there, if there's no diffusion, the he, topological hel helicity of, of a magnetic field is, is conserved. So you can twist small scales. And then large scales will unravel. So this, and so in, basically you can transfer magnetic helicity from small scales to large scales. If this occurs non-locally, if it occurs directly from small scales to large scales, that's basically the turbulent alpha effect. It relies on a transfer of magnetic helicity directly from small scales to large scales. But in MHD turbulence, in helical MHD turbulence, you can get a self-similar cascade of magnetic helicity. So you can be twisting. If you have a helical turbulent flow, you can twist small scales, and it can cascade in a self-similar way out to large scales. And so this is self-similar. This is, this is local in spectral space. This is non-local in spectral space. But they're both manifestations of a deeper reality, I think, is, is that by twisting small scales, you can create large scales. And we see that in simulations. The uh, first uh, demonstration of that was a classic paper in the 70s uh, by Anique Bouquet. This came from a turbulence model that includes uh, in, includes both kinetic helicity and uh, uh, Lorentz force back reaction onto the onto the motions, and the idea this is this is versus scale. So this is helicity as a function of wave number. So this is twisting it on small scales, and as time goes on, helicity cascades up to larger and larger scales. So by twisting it on small scales, so so k large k k is small scales, small k is large scales. So uh, by twisting it on small scales, it goes up and up. So this is a, a closure model, turbulence model. But this is you actually see this in MHD simulations, too. So if you inject helicity on some small scale, and this is a helicity spectrum, you see it cascading up. So this is versus time, uh, time, time one, time two, time three. So as time goes on, if you twist it in a homogeneous isotropic, isotropic but non-reflectional symmetric. So it's quasi-isotropic. Um, you see the magnetic helicity building up. All right, so then we go, uh, so in terms of large-scale dynamos, how these are usually treated is you look at the longitudinal average of the induction equation. So this is the mean magnetic induction equation. You have, so bars here indicate averages over longitude. So if you take the uh, MHD equation, you average over longitude, you get d by dt of the mean field. You get something here. Yeah, I think you went over this a little bit this morning as well. You get something here that looks like the poloidal field, uh, R and theta components, dotted into the omega gradient. This is the omega effect. Uh, meridional circulation can carry around field. And here's a diffusion, a plasma or a molecular diffusion. And curl E, this, this thing is, we'll get back to this. This is called the fluctuating EMF. Um, but there are different, type, different ways of, of approaching this equation. One is, say, and this is by far the most common, is the kinematic model. You specify what omega is. You specify what the meridional flow is. And uh, you specify E as a function of r theta t and the mean field. Oh, I've used brackets here, but it's the same as a bar. So, um, so then you can solve this equation. The other way, you can do non-kinematic mean field models. And you can have, in addition to your induction equation, you can have a momentum equation and an energy equation. And you can solve for what self, well, 
more self-consistently for what the velocity fields will be. So if you have a momentum equation, you can solve for what omega and Vm will be. But you also have to put in um, some kind of turbulent model for the momentum transport and the heat transport. The other way to do this is the full 3D MHD convection simulations, where the velocity field that comes in this simulation, uh, so omega and V and E, are created self-consistently as part of the solution of the full equations. All right, so most, most models are these kinematic models, and that's what we'll be, we'll be playing with in the lab this afternoon. Um, but the omega effect, you may have seen this already. The idea is if you have a poloidal field line, like a, a, a line going from north to south, and the equator is rotating faster than the poles, then this gets stretched out. So this creates toroidal field, east-west field from poloidal, and it also amplifies it. So the magnetic energy increases as well, as well as the direction. All right. But this fluctuating ES, EMF is the, is the holy grail of dynamo theory, is to figure out how, so V prime is the non-axisymmetric flows. So it's the total velocity field minus the axisymmetric part, so minus the differential rotation and meridional flow. And B prime is the total magnetic field minus the mean toroidal and mean poloidal field. So there has to be some kind of correlation between these two. <coughs> um, in order to, to produce, so, so non-axisymmetric correlations, when averaged over longitude, have to produce an axisymmetric field. And if you can't do that, if E is zero, then you can show the dynamo will die. And that's just a, a version of Cowling's theorem. If B prime equals zero, then you're not going to get anything. So the whole, the whole game is to, is to figure out what this, what this E is. Um, and one way you talked about this morning is the turbulent alpha effect. So this looks like E is proportional to the mean uh, field. So E looks like alpha B. And that comes from if you take a magnetic field line, if you lift it up and twist it, then you can go from an east-west field into a north-south field. And so that requires a helicity. So that's those spiraling motions, the lift and twist. So lifting is up. So the velocity is up, the vorticity is up, so there's V dot omega, there's a correlation. So it's linked to kinetic helicity, and it's also linked to magnetic helicity. And it really it illustrates the 3D nature of dynamos, that you can't do this in an axisymmetric way. This, this has to be three-dimensional. Uh, and it closes the dynamo loop. So you can make toroidal field by the omega effect, and you can make poloidal field by this alpha effect, and so, so the, these, these feed into each other. Um, you can also make poloidal, you can also make toroidal field from poloidal field. So you can take, you can take a north-south flow, lift it and twist it into east-west. So alpha squared omegas are possible, and uh, there's been a lot of work on them, but, um, but mainly the omega effect is what's responsible for generating the toroidal field. And alpha, those are called alpha omega dynamos, which we'll play with in the lab this afternoon. Um, so another way you can get an EMF that's not zero. So the story there starts with magnetic buoyancy. So let's say you have a magnetic flux tube sitting somewhere in the deep convection zone. And if this thing is in mechanical equilibrium, just sitting there, then you might say that the pressure in the tube, the total pressure in the tube, which includes the sum of the gas pressure and the magnetic pressure, is approximately equal to the external gas pressure. So if there's, only, there's no magnetic field outside the tube, um, you can set the pressures equal to each other, or approximately equal, so there's no pressure gradients across. But that means the gas pressure within the tube has to be smaller than the external pressure. And you might say, well, there might be a lot of thermal conduction that equalizes the temperature. So the temperature in the tube might not be very different from the external temperature. So if the temperature isn't different, pressure is equal to is the gas constant density times temperature. So if the temperature is the same, the only way you can get a small gas pressure inside the tube is if the density is smaller. But if the density in the tube is smaller than the external density, then you will rise like a hot air balloon. 
So that's called uh, magnetic buoyancy. So if you have a, a strong magnetic flux tube, these things tend to be buoyant. They'll rise to the surface. And so how does that get back to the EMF? Well, we'll get back to that. But the, the idea, that's the first step. You destabilize the magnetic field, make it rise. And now, as it rises, so now this flux tube is going further away from the rotation axis. So if angle momentum is conserved within that flux tube, as it goes further away from the rotation axis, there must be a retrograde flow inside the tube to conserve angular momentum. So you can do your, you can do your right hand rules and stuff. You can convince yourself that if there's a retrograde flow in a rising tube, then the Coriolis force is force. So if there's a flow this way, the Coriolis force is going to, in the northern hemisphere, is going to divert that to the north, right? It'd divert it to the right. So when it pops out, the trailing flux is going to be displaced toward the poles compared to the leading flux. And that's going to be the same in the southern hemisphere. And what's more is because of the way the omega effect works, this sign of the trailing flux is opposite to the pre-existing poloidal field. So if you can move these things to the equator, if you can pinch this off and cancel the leading flux across the equator and move the trailing flux to the poles, eventually you can flip the dipole moment. All right, so this, this is an observed thing. The, the tilt, uh, the higher the latitude, the more the tilt. This is an observed uh, feature of active regions on the sun. It's called Joy's Law. And just to kind of wake you up again. Um, so in the sun, most of the spots that come out are at low latitudes, say less than 50 degrees. But what if all the spots emerged at high latitudes instead of low latitudes? Do you think that would help a Babcock latent dynamo, or would it, would it hurt it? Would the dynamo operate better than before, or would, it, would that hinder the dynamo? So why, why do you think it would help? Yeah. Yeah, so it gets to the poles faster is what you're saying. Yeah, so that, it, it, that, that's true. It gets to the poles, poles faster, so you might expect the cycle period to be shorter, right? If it, if it gets to the poles faster. Yeah, so, so if the cycle period is dependent on how long these things take to get to the poles, then you might think the period might be faster, right? Yeah, it depends on the flux. But let's say the flux is the same for now. So we have one argument for how it can help. Any other ideas on how it might hurt? Yeah. That's right. That's, that's right, yeah. If both of these go to the poles, then eventually they'll, they'll, they'll converge up here and an equal amount of positive and negative flux go to the poles, then it will probably all cancel out, right? So the only way you can build a dipole moment is it's crucial for these, this leading flux to reconnect across the equator. That's the only way you can build a dipole moment because you can integrate off, divergence of the magnetic field is zero, right? So you can integrate over the whole northern hemisphere. The total flux through the whole northern hemisphere due to this emerging spot is zero. So eventually, that flux might cancel out. If you want to build a dipole pole moment, you have to move some of that across the equator. So, so um, going out to higher latitudes, it might, it might shorten the cycle. Uh, the higher latitudes might give you a bigger Joy's Law tilt, which is good for the dynamo. But 
overall, I think it would be bad for the dynamo because, because you wouldn't be able to build a dipole moment. This, this flux would just all cancel out and the thing probably wouldn't work. But it's not, there's both good and bad. Anyway. All right, so the strongest evidence in favor of the Babcock Leighton mechanism is we see it happening on the surface. That if you look at these latitudinal bands, it sure as heck looks like what's causing the poles to flip is this flux that's coming up from the active regions. It looks like that's going up and flipping the poles. And if you calculate the flux emerging in sunspots over the course of the solar cycle, it's almost two orders of magnitude larger than the flux needed to flip the poles. So even if like 98% of that flux cancels out and only 2% gets to the full poles, you can still flip the surface dipole moment. So there are other, you can also do things like uh, the babcock leighton source term is proportional to the amount of flux in spots and the amount of tilt. So you can you can calculate the source term and correlate that with the strength of the next cycle, and there is a correlation. So, um, so the observations are telling us that this, this is uh, to take this model seriously. So, all right, so uh, this going, going back to this V prime cross B prime, uh, different components of this, we went over uh, with uh, Amitabha's lecture this morning. You saw how these things can be derived. Um, from the induction equation and from uh, assumptions about the nature of the turbulence. But commonly used in solar dynamo models is the turbulent alpha effect. E goes like alpha times the mean field. Um, the babcock leighton mechanism is very different. Uh, it's, 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 in terms of the physical justification, justification, it's very different from this. I would say this is essentially nonlinear. The, the idea of the destabilization of a flux tube, the velocity intrinsically depends on the magnetic field. Without the magnetic field, there wouldn't be any velocity. So I would say this V prime is, is intrinsically non, is essentially nonlinear, whereas this is essentially kinematic. This, this is just lifting and twisting in the field. Um, but that said, the way it's implemented in dynamo models is essentially kinematic because it's, it's very different from the turbulent alpha effect, but the way it's actually included in a dynamo model is just as a non-local alpha effect. So you have a poloidal source at the top that depends on the toroidal field at the bottom. And so it looks like alpha times B, except the alpha is at the top and the B is at the bottom. So it's essentially in kinematic in the way it's implemented. Uh, there's also a turbulent diffusion part and a magnetic pumping part. Both of these are very important parts of, of dynamo models. These have to do with the transport of the field, pushing it around. These have, have to do with field amplification. All right, so how does a babcock leighton model work? Uh, so this is, again, this is the, uh, the idea. You start out with a field that's going from south to north. You stretch that out by the omega effect. You make um, toroidal field. That's one way in the north, the other way in the south. And then you lift it up. These become buoyant. They come out to the top. You reconnect this across the equator. You move that to the poles. And you create poloidal field of the opposite sign uh, near the surface. And then that comes. And either through the meridional circulation or through um, turbulent transport, like diffusion or pumping, this gets to the bottom of the convection zone and eventually eats away at the pre-existing poloidal field until you flip it. Um, so these are often called flux transport dynamo models because the meridional flow plays an uh, uh, important role in determining the length of the cycle. And in particular, the flow at the bottom of the convection zone. So the meridional flow here, toward the poles near the top, toward the equator near the bottom, uh, this has two functions. One is to get the poloidal flux from the top that's generated by decaying active regions. You have to get that down to the bottom because that, and the second role of the circulation is the equatorward flow at the bottom it is what accounts for the butterfly diagrams, the migration of the toroidal field toward the equator. It's being pushed along by this equatorward flow. And you work out, this is a walking pace, two to three meters per second. And if you were walking about two to three meters per second, it would take you about 11 years to get from the pole to, of the sun to the, to the equator. So 
a flow of about two to three meters per second at the bottom of the convection zone is what kind of sets the time scale of the cycle. And we'll uh, explore that a little bit in the lab today. All right, so here is a, a three-dimensional Babcock-Layton model that we recently developed. It's kind of fun to play with. But usually, usually Babcock-Layton models uh, parameterize that Babcock-Layton thing as an alpha effect. But we put in specific active regions. So this is a fully 3D model. We put in active regions uh, that depend on the strength of the toroidal field at the bottom. So when the toroidal field is strong, we plunk an active region on top. And these obey Joy's law, so these are tilted. And you can see that the action of the differential rotation, these things, these things get stretched out, and they, they, they form these axisymmetric bands, which then migrate up toward the poles and eventually flip the, flip the polarity of the poles. And this is what it looks like in a cross section. So this is the toroidal field, B phi. Uh, red is eastward, and blue is westward. And this is the poloidal field. I should have this wrong, but I think, I think blue is clockwise, red is counterclockwise. But, so you, you can see all these, all these kind of um, uh, sporadic flickering. These are spots that emerge at, at, the, at the surface. And they, this, this distortion of them by differential rotation, poleward meridional flow, and turbulent diffusion um, gives you a poloidal field that eats away at the pre-existing field and reverses it. All right. Oh, and this is, by the way, this is radial field at the top, and this is the toroidal field at the bottom of the convection zone. So it moves toward the equator, migrates toward the equator. So this is this equator of migration of the toroidal field by the equatorward circulation at the bottom is what's ultimately responsible for the butterfly diagram. Yeah, this is fully 3D. So this is unusual. This is, there's, there's one other model that I know of that's like this, but. No, this is, um, yeah, so the question is, did we actually do rising flux tubes? And, and no, this is a very simple model. It's kinematic, so we put in the differential rotation, we put in the marinella circulation. And we just say, when there's a strong toroidal field at the bottom, we plunk a spot at the top. So it's a deposition. We, we put a spot at the top. And the statistics of those spots um, are chosen from observation. So it's almost a semi-empirical model. So the flux distribution. I'll play that again. The distribution, you see the different sizes. That's taken from solar observations. And the randomness, there's a randomness in the delay times. That's taken from solar observations. So this can't tell you anything about the physics of flux emergence, because we put that stuff in. But it can tell you about how magnetic cycles work. And if you put in, uh, there's a observed scatter around Joy's law. So, so uh, uh, the tilt angle increases with latitude, but there's a big variation. There's a lot of randomness. And if you put in that randomness, you get, you get variability of solar cycles uh, similar to what's, what's observed. You can even go into grand minimum episodes. Um, but a summary of convective dynamo models, uh, the early work was based on mean field theory beginning with Parker in the 50s. And that really dominated through, through the 90s. So this, this was kinematic mean field models, alpha omega dynamo models that we'll, that we'll play with. So the poloidal field is generated by the alpha effect. The toroidal field is generated by the omega effect. And differential rotation here is key in getting magnetic cycles. So you can have alpha squared instead of alpha omega, where both the toroidal field and the poloidal field are generated by twisting, lifting, and twisting. But the, the omega effect is, seems to be crucial in getting those oscillatory solutions of the induction equation. If you do the kinematic induction equation, and there's um, anybody is, who's interested, I can send you a homework problem where you work this out and you show that, um, that if you have an alpha omega dynamo model, you get a cyclic solution, but in alpha squared, you get a steady solution. Um, so these are usually kinematic and axisymmetric. 
And that was, that was seen as an advantage 50 years ago, 60 years ago. But now, now it's really a liability. As, as Amitabha um, pointed out this morning, there's a lot of problems with the kinematic approach. There's no, no real dynamo is kinematic. There's always, there's always feedbacks between the magnetic field and the velocity field, and those can be subtle. Um, so a lot of, in terms of convective dynamo models, recent focus has shifted to 3D simulations. So these are similar in spirit to the planetary dynamo models we discussed earlier. So you don't have to put in any parameterizations for V prime cross B prime. That, that falls out of the simulations. You, you have non-axisymmetric flows and fields, and they make their own correlations. Um, so, and they're not kinematic. So the si simulation itself sets up the differential rotation in the meridional circulation, as I described. The banana cells speed up the equator relative to the poles, and they create a circulation. And uh, so there's been a lot of progress in recent years. But the parameter regimes are still far from, um, still, still far from real stars. So I said that uh, the keys to the planetary dynamo is really um, the keys to, keys to success of the planetary dynamo models are where that RM was realistic. The magnetic Reynolds number was, was what it really is in the planets, so in the simulations. So that, that was a key. And the dynamical balances, like the MAC balance, um, was, can be achieved in simulations. So if you get those two things right, then, then the, the, the models look pretty good. Um, for the sun, we can't achieve solar magnetic Reynolds numbers. That these, the, the magnetic Reynolds of the sun is at least 10 to the seventh. So we, we, can't, we can't achieve those parameters. And uh, so, and in terms of the balances, the MAC balance is out, is out the window, like I said, because the Rossby number is not low, low enough. So it, it's, um, so you have to take caution in taking these models and applying them to real stars. But nevertheless, they, they do give a lot of insight. So these are uh, convective dynamo simulations. This is the radial velocity. Uh, so again, uh, uh, yellow is upflow. Uh, blue here is downflow. This is a radial velocity near the surface. This is differential rotation. Uh, they have a fast equator, slow pole. They have more Taylor Proudman alignment uh, some th than the sun. So the sun is more radial, and these are more cylindrical. But they, still, they have a comparable contrast of about 30% between equator and pole. Uh, this is the mean toroidal field. So they create one sign in the north, another sign in the south. And this is a butterfly diagram, but it's not the radial field at the surface. It's the toroidal field at the bottom. So this is toroidal field averaged over longitude as a function of latitude and time. And then these are three simulations. This is the solar rotation rate of 28 days. This is three times the solar rotation rate. This is five times. So as you spin it up, the velocity stick scales get smaller, but the magnetic field gets more organized. So this is what you expect from mean field theory, that this kind of has an alpha effect. This has uh, more helicity, more shear, leads to magnetic self-organization. So here, the mean fields occupy about 3% of the magnetic energy. Most of it's in turbulent fluctuations. Here, it's more like 50%. And they're coherent in time. So here, these things persist. The rotation period is 9.3 days. The convection time scale is about a month. These things persist in the convection zone for as long as we ran the simulation, 40 years. Um, but then you spin it up a little more, and it starts reversing. You start to see reversals of the magnetic field. And so there's been a lot more work on this uh, than in magnetic reversals in planetary dynamos. So these are, this is a, a recent case where we got a reversing dynamo. This is a paper that just came out in Science, uh, the Montreal group, Paul Charbonneau and colleagues. So this shows the toroidal field near the bottom of the convection zone. And it's going through these magnetic cycles. And it has these equator propagation a bit. So these are looking um, very promising. Another thing is that the cycle period relative to the rotation period is on the order of 100, which is comparable to the sun. So the early models, um, Peter Gilman in the 1980s, these were comparable. But now having a cycle period that's much longer than the rotation period is something that's just been, it's just been since about 2010 that we've actually been able to achieve this. And it's, the main key is just higher and higher resolution. 
Um, so which one is right? Which is, so is the sun running a convective dynamo or a babcock Leighton dynamo? And the difference is what's the source of the polotal field? Is it this lifting and twisting of the, of the toroidal field by convection? Or is it the active regions? Is it the toroidal, is it the magnetic buoyancy that, that makes these things, makes flux tubes rise and then their redistribution on the surface flips the polotal field? And we don't really know. It's, it's, uh, it's a combination of both, probably. It depends on what meetings you go to. If you go to planetary dynamo meetings, they'll say it's obviously this, because that's the way the planetary dynamos work. If you go to solar physics, physics meetings, most solar physicists are the dermatologists who study the surface of the sun and above. And they know about diagrams like this. And they'll say it's obviously a badcock Leighton dynamo, because we see it. So. <laughs> So if you want to get into dynamo theory, we need your help. Um, so let me back the time. <coughs> oh, it is overtime, isn't it? Oh, OK. So I'll, I'll just do quickly um, why 11 years. So if you look at the um, uh, in the induction equation, the length scale of the solar cycle is determined uh, by the propagation of bands toward the equator. And propagation, there's basically three ways to get propagation. One is the meridional circulation, as I described. One is magnetic pumping. That magnetic pumping vector acts as a velocity, so it can push around magnetic field. Um, another is a dynamo wave. So if you make toroidal field, and you make poloidal field, and you make toroidal field on the equatorward edge each time, then you can have a field that propagates toward the equator. And that was the early Parker Alpha Omega Dynamo models. Oops, down here. The early Alpha Omega Dynamo, mo mo dynamo models, it's basically waves. Um, meridional circulation has been the, the rage in the last 20 uh, years from babcock leighton models. Um, but people are starting to consider turbulent transport more, the, the idea of magnetic pumping and, um, and trying to get a handle on that. I'll just, one, one quick last point. Um, so if you look at the magnetic activity in stars, this is x-ray flux, which comes from the corona. So this is a proxy for magnetic activity. And if you, and this is the rotation period in days, the sun has about a 30-day 30, 30 rotation period. As you go to faster and faster stars, the magnetic field increases with, as you increase the rotation rate. But then it saturates. The, if you go to a rotation period faster than about three days, then the magnetic field becomes independent of omega. And about the same time, these are opposite. This is rotation period. This is rotation rate. So here, these are the fast rotators. Here, these are the fast rotators. But if you look at the differential rotation, it increases as you spin it up until you get to about three days, and then it goes all wonky. But this is the regime where we can really um, make a connection between stars and planets. Because this saturation regime is probably a lot what, what, like what a planetary dynamo is running, where, where, you, where you're tapping the most, uh, you're, you're operating at maximum efficiency. So here, you might expect the magnetic field to be determined really by how much energy flux and the luminosity of the star. So as you spin it up, you, you really um, tap more and more of the magnetic energy until you reach a saturation. But, um, but there are a lot of puzzles. And you have these slides. You can kind of go through this. But since I'm over time, then I'll, I'll just stop and we can get, get going with the lab. Should we have a break first? <laughs>